There's a rose in Bethlehem With a beauty quite divine Perfect in this world of sin On this silent holy night There's a fragrance blushed like gold that it stands upon the wind, reaching out to every soul from a longing angel crib. Oh, rose of Bethlehem, how softly pure and sweet. To glorify the Father, or to wear the cross for me. There's a rose in Bethlehem, colored red. Surely what will be yours for a tear of morning dew is rolling down the hills. Oh, rose of Bethlehem, how lovely, pure, and sweet. To glorify the Father, born to wear the thorns for me. There's a rose in Bethlehem with a beauty quite divine, perfect world of sin on this silent holy night. Oh, rose of Bethlehem, how lovely, pure, and sweet, or to glorify the Father, born to wear Happy New Year and welcome to this time of worship. We come to this table of grace today. God feeds us with the bread of life. We're reminded he gives us grace and life. He sustains us and gives us reason to flourish. Welcome to all of you to extended family as you're here with us and visitors. My name is Pastor Chris and welcome to Faith Church. It's wonderful you can worship with us today. I invite you to stand and receive God's greeting as we begin this new year and this time of worship. It all begins with God's grace. Receive it now. Grace to you in peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit and as one people we say together, amen. We greet each other as God has greeted us. So nice to have you here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is fun. Yeah, this is good. (laughs) 
We hear these words that call us to worship from Isaiah 55. You have to listen closely because it's an invitation to a feast. But it's a free feast. And as we hear from John's gospel and Jesus being the living bread, as we take bread and juice today, we're invited to a portion of that feast that is to come. All of you who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come and buy food and eat. Without money, at no cost, buy wine and milk. And we're asked the question, why spend money on what isn't food and your earnings for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest of feasts. Listen to me and you will live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful loyalty to David. Seek the Lord where he can still be found. Call on him while he is yet near. We do that in our worship and we begin this morning as we sing Lord Most High. Lord, most high, be magnified. 
may be seated, except for the kids, who I'll invite to come up here with me. We'll sit on these steps today. Happy New Year. Did anyone stay up all the way till New Year? No? Okay. Well, I brought something today. And I think I've brought this before. Have I brought bread before, maybe? I know a while back I, I brought, I think I brought bread, but I can't remember. I'm getting old and the years get too many. But I, um, I know we learned about give us today our daily bread. And we, we learned about praying for bread. Now today, and it's wrapped up in a little sandwich bag. I'll keep it there. I don't want to make a mess. We're going to learn today about Jesus who says, I am the living bread. I'm the living bread. Does anybody know, why would Jesus say, I'm like bread? Does anybody have a guess? It's a hard question, actually. Where does bread go when you eat it? On jelly. On jelly. Jelly goes on the bread. Where do you put the bread? In your stomach. That's right. You go in your mouth. It goes all the way down. And it feeds your stomach. Sometimes you might say, my belly. If, you're, if it hurts, you might call it, my tummy hurts. But it goes into your stomach, right? So bread feeds your stomach. So Jesus says, I am like bread that feeds your stomach, which means God gives us the things we need. He gives us the food we need. But I started thinking about other parts of the body. And I wrote it down on, the, on a note so I wouldn't forget because I thought of some good things. I was thinking about how our mind, let's point to our, our head. Our mind gets hungry. Can you point to your head? What do you think our mind gets hungry for? Do we put, does our mind need bread? No. No, what do you think our mind needs? Food. food. What kind of food, though? Fruits. Fruits? Healthy foods are good for your brain. But I was thinking our brain feeds on the truth. Our brain feeds on the truth. And we learn about truth from the Bible. We learn about it when we listen, sometimes even in songs, that we just sang some songs that help us learn about the truth about God. As we pray, we pray from our minds, and we, we learn, too, from the truth of prayers that we hear when we are in worship. I was thinking about our heart. We point to our heart. Do you think your heart needs food? What kind of food do you... Yeah. That's exactly what I wrote down. Love. Man, he got it right away. He's on the ball. He's a, start, a good start to a new year. Our, our hearts need love. They need to be told God loves you. And they're, our hearts need to know we love God back and we love our neighbor. Now, here's a hard one, our soul. And I learned the sign language. You kind of pinch your fingers like this. Can you do this? I don't know if I'm doing it right, but it's all kind of down by your belly. And it was like a wave, like you're pulling up a string. Somewhere your soul, and that's kind of a good sign. Our souls need food. Soul food, we call it. What do you think our souls need? This is a really hard question. I don't know if the adults wouldn't even have good guesses today. They're probably still tired. Bread. I heard bread, maybe. Our souls need to belong. God says, you belong to me. You belong to me. I'm using... Um, the Heidelberg Catechism to help me with that one, the adults. Berries are good. Berries are good for your body. And I, don't, I think your soul might like berries. That's a good question. So our mind needs the truth. Our hearts need love. Our soul needs to belong. And yes, our stomachs need food. So when Jesus says, I am like bread, we have to remember he feeds us in all kinds of ways. He takes care of us. Our bodies need guts. They do. Important. Gut health is important. He's got a New Year's resolution here. So let's pray and thank God that he feeds us from Jesus in lots of different ways. And let's pray that he would feed us today as we worship, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you give us food. You remind us today Jesus is like bread to us. He is bread that gives us life. We hear and, and experience that life when we worship you. So whether we are here in church and we hear your word, we pray that we hear it and receive it as like food, 
or we go to walkout worship and we learn your stories and we worship you, we pray that it would feed us like food too and help us to share the food that we've been given. Help us to show others your love and belonging. We thank you that you feed us always and we think about that especially at the beginning of a new year. You are good, God, and we thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. You're great listeners today. And Maddox is getting better. Look at him. All right, you can go to walk out worship. We begin a new year and a new sermon series. We did Revelation, and then we did Mark as we looked at Advent and Christmas. As we begin a new year, we're going to do the seven I am statements. Those are found in God's uh, word from John's gospel. Today we look at the bread of life, and it's fitting as we receive bread at this table. Um, it's a good way to begin a new year. Some of us might have made a resolution to cut carbs in the new year, but we think about what it means to have daily bread, and even more importantly, more enduringly sort of to say, the bread of life in Jesus. Uh, today we look at John 6, and we're going to jump in midway through, and let me just summarize. In John 6, uh, verses 1 through 14, uh, we hear a story that's pretty common to all the Gospels. Jesus feeds the 5,000. That's one of the signs in John's Gospel, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Seven I am statements, seven signs. And then, in verses 16 to 14, comes another sign. Jesus walks on water. So we get to verse 25, and it says, they. They are the crowd. Jesus and the disciples have crossed uh, the sea. And the crowd, who has been fed, their stomachs are full, or at least partially full. They were from the day before. They're content. But they come seeking something else. It seems like they want more for their stomachs. And so we pick up the conversation in John 6, verses 25, and I'll read to verse 51. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you that you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but... For the good, for the that that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you give that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down out of heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who has sent me. And there is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, 
whose father and mother we know, how can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one could come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one who has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. May God bless this reading of his word today. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, even if you're not very big into uh, movies or music, and even if you were born decades after the 1960s, I think every one of you are at least familiar. You might not be able to sing it, but you know the song Mrs. Robinson by Simon and Garfunkel. One of the many memorable lines in the song, and maybe you could sing it, I'm not going to try. Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns its lonely eyes to you. What's that you say, Mrs. Robinson? Jolt and Joe has left and gone away. Now this uh, line uh, raised far more questions than I, I imagined it did. First of all, uh, one time Paul Simon was on the Dick Cavett show, and Mickey Mantle happened to be on the show at the same time, so... The Mick asked him, hey, why did you use Joe DiMaggio and not me? Paul Simon's answer to the Yankee star was simple. Wrong amount of syllables. But more interesting was the time that Paul Simon met Joe DiMaggio. Now, the story goes they came to a restaurant together. I don't know if they just happened to be there or if it was arranged. But they sat down in a restaurant. And Joe asked him, what do you mean? Where have I gone? I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still around. <laughs> and this is kind of funny and a little bit sad. He said, I'm selling Mr. Coffee Machines. I'm the spokesman for the Bowery Savings, and I haven't gone anywhere. Now, I, I had to crunch the numbers, but I, I knew just from basic memory that by the time the song Mrs. Robinson came out in 1968, I knew Joe DiMaggio had long been retired. So I always took it at face value that it was talking about his retirement from baseball not his existence from the earth. So I had to look up the numbers to confirm this. And yes, when the song came out, he'd been retired from baseball for 16 years. So I always assumed it had something to do with that. One of the greats had gone away from the game. He'd retired. And so Paul Simon explained it to Joe in the restaurant that day. He said, summarizing what he said, I said, I didn't mean the lines literally, uh, I, that I thought of him as an American hero and that genuine heroes were in short supply. And so Joe accepted the explanation. Thank we, we shook hands and we said goodnight. Later, as uh, he explained it again after Joe DiMaggio's death, uh, and I, at one point it was on the show 60 Minutes, he explained a little bit more in depth. In the 1950s and 60s, Paul Simon said, it was fashionable to refer to baseball players as a metaphor for America. And DiMaggio represented the values of America, excellence, and the fulfillment of duty, because he often played through injury, with an implied purity of spirit, an off-the-field dignity, and even a private life. When, when Paul Simon told this story on 60 Minutes, he told the then Mike Wallace, obviously, Joe DiMaggio, he said with a wry smile, isn't used to thinking of himself as a metaphor. Now, most of us probably wouldn't think of ourselves metaphorically. I, I'll give an example in a minute, but we usually take things at face value when it comes to our lives. Or we, when somebody asks us what we do, we, we give a straight answer. We don't give some obscure metaphorical answer that they're like, what? But when it comes to Jesus, we're pretty used to him as a metaphor. The Bible talks this way, notably, John's Gospel. 
um, the I am statements, we'll look at all of them. Six out of seven, maybe all seven are metaphors. One of them, I think the resurrection, I'm the resurrection. That's a metaphor, but I, I think that's literal too. Um, I think you could say there's some metaphor there. But if you think about it, almost all these are metaphorical in a way. And so we're used to this. You probably have a general idea. I hope you learn something new or we apply it in fresh ways. But my point is we're used to Jesus as a metaphor. We take it for granted. It's the hindsight is 2020 thing. When people would hear Jesus, as you heard today, it raised a lot of confusion. What in the world are you talking about? This makes no sense. This sounds like blasphemy. Hey, why does he say this? That's Mary and Joseph's son. He's not from heaven. He's, what, what do you mean, bread? So, so we take for granted some of these things that are said about Jesus in John's gospel and those red letter words that Jesus says about himself, straight from the mouth, I am. And so we hear these I am statements in the next few weeks. But along with these I am statements, John has a book of signs, seven and seven. And uh, you make your way out after church on the Welcome Center there. I made a little chart. If you have a good study Bible, it probably lists these. Before this series, if I were to take a quiz on what are the seven signs and seven I am statements, it wouldn't have been a good grade. Maybe you're there too, so we'll have a good refresher. Uh, but there's seven I am's and seven signs. And Jesus even mentioned signs, signs a couple times in our passage today. As I thought about it this week, a good way to think about it is John's story of Jesus is a show and tell. The signs are sort of the show part. These are signs. There's something up. God is showing us something. There's hints, if not pretty clear indicators of divinity in these signs. Walking on water is a big one. But then there's the tell, uh, the talking about it, the I am statements, the seven I am statements that Jesus himself speaks, the show and tell. And John's whole point of his gospel is summarized in the very end. So this kind of gives us the big picture. You might remember this memorable conclusion at the end of John's gospel, and it made you wonder. Jesus performed many other signs, it says, and in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Makes you wonder what some of those other ones were. But John's goal is clear, that the world may know that this is Jesus, and Jesus is the Messiah, and the Messiah is the Son of God. That's the goal that John has in telling this story. One thing I, I came to appreciate as I thought of these is that Jesus is like a good writer. If you ever had to write anything, and some of you have, it's been a while, but you probably remember the advice, the axiom, <laughs> show, don't tell. And Jesus, of course, does both, but the showing, the signs lead the way. So by the time we get to this very first I am statement, there's been five signs already, two of which I just summarized. He feeds the 5,000. That's a sign. And then closely followed after it is the walking on water. That's a sign. Five signs, and then he starts talking about I am. Uh, so this is kind of something that is fitting. We know, and you've heard probably me quote it. You know the quote. You've heard others preach this sermon. You might even have preached yourself, and probably using that line from St. Francis of Assisi. You probably could say it right now. Preach the gospel, it says, and when necessary, use words. So you've probably been told, and I want to reemphasize that, we lead by doing. We lead in terms of sharing our faith or telling people about Jesus. We lead by doing. And it was a good reminder to me, this is actually what Jesus himself does. He leads by doing and then talking. But it also makes more sense to have the doing precede uh, the talking. It gives a context. It gives a story. So, of course, it makes sense if you're going to talk about the bread of life that you don't just do this sort of randomly. You do this after you've fed 5,000 people, after they've had food put into their stomachs. Then you talk about this bread they've been fed, and you expand upon it. Let me give an example that's kind of funny um, of talking metaphorically. If you go into our outer office and make a photocopy, you might notice in the window, there's a little sign, 
And somebody put this in there for Jan. We, I don't know if we ever found out who it was a surprise. And it reads, Chaos Coordinator for Jan Burkham, our, our office administrator. Now, let's just say that if you were a new person in church and you saw Jan playing the piano and, and you came up afterward and maybe you like music or you're a piano player and thank you for playing the piano. My name's Tim. And you introduce yourself to Jan. And Jan just said to, her, to the person, well, good to meet you. I'm the chaos coordinator. You, you would have no idea what she's talking about. You would think that maybe people are fighting over who gets to play the piano or there's some chaos in here that she manages or maybe that she's the worship director. Well, well that's actually Jennifer's job. But if you saw Jan in her office and saw her doing at least work or just even sitting there, you, you oh, that makes sense. This is a good description of what she does. So Jesus has shown, I give you food in abundance. I've given you a lot of bread from a little bit of bread. And of course, this feeding, and I didn't read that part. I summarized the first 14 verses. We're pretty familiar with that story. It reminds them what we heard in our passage. This is a little bit like another story. This is a little bit like when manna came to us from, from heaven, right? The, the Israelites, that word manna meant, what is this? Uh, literally in Hebrew, because they were so surprised by this. Where is this gift coming from? And enough would come each day. And so, so, so they're filled in the wilderness, and they think this is, this is kind of familiar. It's new to us, but familiar to our story. And then Jesus talks about, about this, this I am statement. Uh, this group, this crowd, well, they went the long way. <laughs> they went the long way around the lake. And we heard Jesus kind of says, I know why you're here. You want more bread. You want more food. So they ask him, Rabbi, when did you get here? One way to think of this, and I hinted at it with the kids, other parts of us need filling, and other parts of us need food. So here we have bellies that are full. But if you think of hearts, they're not so full. The bellies are full of bread, but the hearts are sort of empty, at least empty to wonder. They've not had the bread for their hearts yet. And so basically Jesus says to them, you're only here because I've given you food for your belly. You missed the point of what I'm trying to show you. I think of that, um, I think it's from Corinthians, the food is uh, their God and they fill, they fill their stomach. And so Jesus is saying, you, you're leading with your stomach and you're thinking with your stomach and you're preoccupied with what can fill your belly. We might easily say that uh, these people have it all wrong. Being short-sighted, though, I think is a good way of thinking of it. Uh, we do need food. We do need stuff for the stomach. And it's sort of typical in our relationship with God. As I thought about myself, I tend to worry about the physical needs I have. In other words, uh, I feel my soul is okay. If you were to die today, uh, that question. Well, I know my soul's in good hands. I don't want to, I don't want to leave behind my family, but I, I know... I, I belong to Jesus, and I'm not worried about my soul. In some ways, I might say of all of us, we might neglect our soul. We take it for granted. What stresses me out is when a big unexpected bill comes. That's going to ruin my day and surprise me in a bad way. Or how are we going to pay for this? Look at this. Look at the, how much gas costs now. Ugh. So we worry about both, or we should. It's not like one or the other. But Jesus is saying, there's more than just your stomach. There's more than just your physical needs. And I am giving you a much, much bigger feast, is what he's um, telling these folks today. And, and so he um, reminds them uh, that don't waste your uh, energy striving for perishable food, but work for food that sticks with you, food that nourishes you for lasting life. This is what I, the Son of Man, provide, and what is guaranteed by God the Father to the last. And so they hear that and they say, wait a minute, did he say there's more? Did he say th there's better food than what he, he, that was pretty cool what he did back there, but is it better? And then finally, did he say free? And so begins this question, well, what do we have to do? What work do we have to do? Which is what Jesus says, you have some work to do to get this food. It's sort of like that call to worship I read. Buy, buy stuff, buy food with the money you don't have, 
and you're thinking, wait a minute, how can we buy when we don't have money? It's implied, and you have to listen. It's free. And that's kind of the dynamic here. But, but they start thinking, well, what, what work do we have to do then to get this really good deal? It's free, but there's something to do. And having to do something is kind of the way they've always done things. You know, we have that stereotype, and for some ways it's very true. They had to do a lot of stuff, like the sacrificial system, or there were some pretty hard covenantal laws. I know I'm glad we don't have to keep. And we still take God's instruction, say the Ten Commandments, seriously, but, but not quite the same way that the Old Testament folks did. And so they're wondering, we've got to follow some rules. We've got to do some stuff to earn this, right? That's one of the ways they're thinking of it. Or maybe it's just far more practical, <laughs> and we could relate. This sounds really good, too good, too good to be true. And so they're asking, okay, what's the catch? And so Jesus explains in verses 30 to 32 that this work that they are to do, it's been done for them. The work that God wants you to do, well, God has done the work for you. Hint, it's a gift. This is one of those pictures of grace. You've got to do all this work, but God has done it for you. That is a gift. That is grace. What you need to do is see that, that this is what you want. See this is what you need and be ready to accept it. The one who filled their bellies is offering to fill, you could say, their hearts or their souls, that this is God's gift. This is the beautiful consistency Good way to begin the year. A beautiful consistency to God. Just simply said, God has already done it. That's a good way to begin a year. Thinking about our wants, our needs, the things we need physically, and the things we need spiritually. And begins this I am statement, I am the bread of life. Many of you see and probably have heard the connection, I am, to the great I am, this very echo of God's personal name, the one he gave to Moses, the I am that the Hebrew people would dare not to speak. He tells Moses, you tell Israel that I am has sent you. And I was reminded, I'm very rusty on my Greek, but in the Greek language, it wasn't necessary to say I am uh, when you have a verb. Uh, and they're highly inflected. So each verb has its own ending. So I or us or we those kind of get smushed in uh, to the conjugation of these verbs. So in other words, if you say I am, it's sort of language-wise going out of your way. It's emphatic. And so it's not an accident that Jesus is saying I am. I am will jump out to these people. I am in a way that is fiercely reminiscent to Yahweh. He's saying basically I'm Yahweh. The great I am of Abraham of Isaac and of Jacob, of creation, the God of the Exodus, the God who in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. Well, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. So they had just seen, they had tasted by one of those signs. Their stomachs had been full, and now they come back the next day, still hungry. The one uh, that they recognize, interestingly enough, uh, I'm reminded, maybe you know this, Bethlehem means house of bread. So house of bread, the person from house of bread now says, I'm the house, uh, I am bread itself. The house of bread is the home to the bread of life. Another one of those surprises in the life of Jesus. And anyone who comes to be will never ever be hungry and never ever be thirsty again. Sort of a double negative, a double emphasis that God will do this. It won't happen. You won't go hungry. You won't go thirsty. Jesus is giving this first opportunity to work, to trust this message, but also trust the messenger by using this emphatic statement. You will never, ever. Jesus gives and gives alone. It echoes what I read at the beginning of Isaiah 55. All who are thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, come and buy food to eat without money at no cost. Buy wine and milk. I like that invitation. We have nothing. We bring nothing to this table. 
You don't come to this table because, well, I, I know my theology good enough now. Or I've been good enough morally. Or, or, hey, I'm a deacon or an elder, so I guess I deserve to come to this table. Or whatever, whatever you want to say to sort of um, boost your bank account. We come out of grace. We come out of need. We come with nothing and receive everything. In a way, you can say this invitation that we taste today is unlimited in its generosity. It's unlimited when you have nothing and never have anything, but are filled and never go empty. This is all a gift. Here's an illustration that I, I really like, and, and maybe it'll stick with us. After World War II, the number of hungry orphans in Europe uh, was overwhelming to Allied troops who kind of did the cleanup work, you might say. Children were placed in camp where, camps where they could be well cared for, and most importantly, they could be fed. Uh, those who were left in charge were surprised, unpleasantly, to see that the children... Um, despite excellent care and despite getting food uh, and enough food, were not sleeping well. They were overcome with anxiety and with fear, probably PTSD before we knew to call it that. Not that we understand all of it, but we have a better grasp now than they did then. But a psychologist, who was a little bit ahead of things, finally decided to try something unique. It seemed like a safe uh, thing to test. Give each child a piece of bread to hold after he or she was put to bed. So go to sleep instead of with a teddy bear with a piece of bread. Sleep with a piece of bread. The result of this experiment was somewhat astounding. Each child's demeanor changed, and the children started sleeping a whole lot better. They slept in peace, you might say. These orphans of World War II uh, had to relearn. Uh, they had to sleep with this bread to overcome what was well-grounded in their story a scarcity of not having enough, of not having daily bread. They were anxious because they didn't know if there would be food the next day. You might say they struggled with provisions. Holding on to this bread brought to them peace. You might even word, use that biblical word we, you hear from the pulpit, shalom. It brought shalom to their exhausted soul. Now, I'm not sure I would recommend any of us need to take uh, bread with us into the bedroom. But I've heard this metaphor applied, and I didn't know the story, and so now it makes a lot more sense as a practice of gratitude. So at the end of the day, for example, you can do this, look back on the day, and count the ways that God was physically providing or spiritually present. Uh, you can do this in kind of short order while you brush your teeth, or maybe this helps you fall asleep to bed and, and go to bed and sleep well, and you can thank God. There's some more structured ways to do this. There's even a spiritual practice, and I could um, print you out a copy from a spiritual disciplines handbook that if you're interested, and, and you can look online, I can direct you that way, that, that there's actually a structured way you can go about doing this, an intentional way, but I think you get the picture that you look back and you hold with gratitude the ways in which God tangibly brings life. Bread as it's always talked about in the Bible, is a both and, physically and spiritually. It's always both. The Heidelberg Catechism, when you might remember, we did the Lord's Prayer, and you pray for daily bread. It reminded us, the example, the explanation, is that when we pray this, we are praying that we depend completely for God, for everything it says we need, both physically and spiritually. It's both and. Reminds me of a Max Lucado quote. Very simple, but kind of profound. Hints at the things I use with the children. God provides fire for the heart and food for the stomach. Your eternal salvation and your evening meal, they come from the same hand. God is the source of all good things, he says. That means that all of us, whether we are rich or we are poor, we are all beggars before God. So I think that's the good invitation for this year, but really all the time. It, it, the beginning of a new year just kind of arbitrarily pauses us and we think about life, we think about where it's headed, we think about goals and routines, but it's a good time to stop and pause at the beginning of a year and say, we're beggars, we stand in need, I need a lot, and God is good and generous and providing. 
That's the invitation to stand in need, being ready to receive from God. I've said it before, it's sort of like sports. Spiritually speaking, we have to stand in this ready position, ready to receive, ready to take grace, ready to do something with this grace. Now, just a little bit past our reading today, and I want to give one more image to kind of close this out. Jesus concludes, I am the living bread that comes from heaven, and whoever eats this bread will live forever. We heard that. And, and I will give this life through me. This is my flesh. Now, in verse 54, which is a little past where I read, Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Uh, an echo, a refrain of raising. But now, apparently, when Jesus uh, is using this word, he says, eat. When he says eat the whole time up until verse 54, it's a normal verb for eat. Just how we think of eat. But in verse 54, when he says eat, um, what he's saying is apparently sort of like to chew with your mouth open. Very interesting, kind of funny image. Now, as a dad... Um, this is when I go from the jovial, fun-loving pastor, Chris, you know, and if, if there's open mouth eating at the table, I'd go to grumpy dad right away. I get like some of you who are probably, stop doing that. That's disgusting. Knock it off. I don't like open mouth eating. It's a bad habit. So I don't know what, what Jesus is talking about here. Eat with your mouth open. And I'm not going to tell you, do that while we have the Lord's Supper today. Chomp and slurp and eat with your mouth open. Uh -uh, don't do that. But it's kind of an interesting, maybe, metaphor again. John, who likes metaphors, and Jesus, too. And I don't know exactly what it means. But don't do this in the big circle for everyone to see. But I also say those words from Corinthians a lot when I'm at this table saying words. Whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're not only just taking stuff in for your, a little bit for your stomach, but mostly for your heart and soul, but... But, and it's not my words, but Paul's words to the Corinthian church, it's God's words to us, but you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. So maybe we can say, and maybe it's a metaphor, don't do it literally, uh, don't keep what you eat to yourself. <laughs> I like this image. You want others to see this living bread. You don't, don't, don't get in this bad habit in, in this new year of eating with your mouth open, but... <laughs> Take this bread of life and don't just keep it for yourself. Share this bread. Let others see so that the world may know that others would see through you and the way that you maybe uh, have a need, the, the way you stand, your ready posture, your, your standing in need of God and your capacity to receive from God. Maybe others would see this. They would see in a spiritual sense how you chew, that, you, that your mouth is open. Come to me, and you will never go hungry. This must be held in tension with another thing Jesus also says. Blessed are those, in Matthew, blessed are those who hunger and who thirst. Now, there's a difference between being hungry and hungering, between thirsting and being thirsty. When we are hungry and thirsty, the conditions Jesus promises that we will never, ever be, we can feed on him spiritually. We lack. We need something. We are in need of food and drink. We are in need of what this symbolizes. We aren't meant to think of Jesus' promise and commitment to that, that we, will, uh, never, um, we will never be short of supply. So in a spiritual sense, we're trusting God for the good things, but we're hungering and thirsting for more. In other words, we stand in need. Always stand with an open mouth ready to receive. The Old Testament prophets speaking, speak of hunger and thirsting for God's righteousness. Song of Songs is another kind of interesting book. Maybe I'll preach it one day. I haven't done it yet. But it talks about yearning at another level for the enjoyment of God, continuing to hunger and thirst. Here's a line that will close us out um, from the life of Gregory, uh, or the life of Moses by Gregory of, of Nyssa. He was a 4th century guy, and he described it this, and this is a great New Year's commitment. This is truly the vision of God, he says. Never be satisfied in the desire to see him. No limit to God can be found, nor is the increasing desire for the good to be brought to an end, because it's never satisfied. So 
it's that both and. We know that Jesus can satisfy, and yet we should always sort of be unsatisfied and wanting more, receiving more. So, Happy New Year. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. People of God, what do you hunger and thirst for in your life? Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the life you give so freely, so graciously. So we pray that we would receive it and receive it well. Give us this life in Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Bless us as we receive it today. We pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. This may be an unfamiliar song to you. Please sing along when you feel comfortable. may be seated. There's a number of announcements in our bulletin, requests to um, sign that wonderful gift that was given to me and uh, my family, uh, a puzzle, and there's a white border. Um, if you don't know what that is, I think if you just check it out in the fellowship hall, it'll make sense. We are looking for some help with walkout worship, be thinking and praying for nominations for um, council. We're to that point of the year again. Um, Community meal will be this week. Uh, there's a number of events that are coming, fellowship food events, this week on uh, Thursday, January 5th, so you're invited to come. If you haven't done that, maybe uh, this is a good time to come. Card ministry will be meeting uh, also this week on Thursday. Uh, this next Sunday, this is an important one, we will have a brunch to meet our new missionaries, and so there's information about that. We're looking for some help. Let Mary Deckinga know, and her phone number is there. Um, this is a great couple, Alec and Alex from Agape and Ecclesia. We added them to the missionaries we support. They do church and a community at Loyola. They're really great people, so please uh, make that a point to attend. 
Uh, you'll really enjoy getting to meet them and hearing what God is doing through their ministry. The Gem Spaghetti Supper, uh, Save the Date, uh, Saturday, January 28th. So mark that and put that in your calendars. We have some great events coming up. Uh, let us turn to God in a time of prayer. <clears throat> God of all time, past, present, and the God who makes all things new. We think about that in a new year. We bring before you the year that's gone by. We look back at it still. For life, full and good, for opportunities recognized and taken, for love known and shared, we thank you. 2022 could be like a piece or maybe a loaf of bread we could hold and look back and see you were there. And maybe we would say now you were there and we didn't know it at the time. In the ways we have fallen short, forgive us. When we worry over what is the past, we pray that you free us. As we begin again and take our first steps into the future, where really nothing is safe and nothing is certain except you and your goodness, we ask for the courage of the Magi, who simply went and followed a star. We ask for their wisdom in choosing to pursue the deepest truth, not knowing where they would be led. In the year to come, God of all time, be our help and be our uh, company. Even, yes, hold our hands as we journey onward and may the promise of your shalom, where all will be at peace, be to us a guiding star. We confess as we begin anew that sometimes we think we can do things all by ourselves and sometimes we're just worried about things. We forget that you give us everything body and soul, physically and spiritually. We ask that you forgive us for thinking about ourselves first. Please forgive us for not trusting you to take care of us. Thank you for always loving us even when we forget that we need you. We ask that your powerful hands be evident in our lives. We pray today for Val and Ken Heisinger. We pray for Val as she continues to heal and slowly gain strength as they sit and wait, and as this week, they meet with doctors, and they learn more about the type of cancer they deal with and recommended treatments going forward. Give them that delicate balance of peace and wisdom, the ability to accept uh, guidance, but also question when needed. That's so much to manage emotionally, physically, mentally. So guide them. We pray for Carolyn Hallen and for her family in the ways that she needs your healing and wholeness and for her family as they do their best to care for her in this time in which she understands probably little of what's happening for her. We hold before you others. Some of us might say this speaks of us. We really wonder what this year holds. We might wonder if our health will decline or will continue to get worse. Some of us humbly might say this might be our last calendar year on this earth. Or we think about this with parents or loved ones, maybe a spouse. We pray and hold that before you, that in all of our circumstances, we would have the faith to hold on to your promise that you will work good things for our good, even when we see no good. And we pray for our church, for the year ahead in ministry. We begin to think about official things and structural things, like uh, elders and deacons. We thank you for those who are currently serving, those who have been uh, faithful and serving in the past. And we pray that as we serve a year ahead, you will bless our efforts. Yes, the things we do under this roof and together, but also the ministry that we do as your scattered church, the ways we serve you as families and as individuals. We pray that you'll not only bless us, that we would find it to be meaningful and joyful in our service, but to you be the glory in what we do and how we do it. Lord of time, at the beginnings and endings, give us good judgment to know what things to do for you in this new year, to grant the inner strength to finish the jobs we begin so that we might fully know the joy of doing your will and your kingdom would come on earth. In this new year, we pray to live deeply with purpose, to live freely with detachment, to live wisely and with humiliation to live justly with compassion, to live longingly with fidelity, to live mindfully with awareness, 
to live gracefully with generosity, to live fully with enthusiasm. Your grace goes with us and ahead of us and behind us, and so we thank you. Help us to hold this vision and daily renew it in our hearts, becoming ever more one with you and our truest selves in Jesus Christ. We pray this today and always in his name. Amen. The offerings that we'll receive and place those in the baskets on the way out will be for the Southwest Christian School, so may we give with thankful hearts. And we hear the words of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he told them, take and eat. This is my body, and it is given for you. Whenever you take this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the complete forgiveness of all of your sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. And as I said in the sermon, these words from 1 Corinthians, every time that you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. So with joy, we praise you, gracious God, for you created heaven and you created earth. God, you made us in your image and you kept covenant with us even when we fell into sin. So we give you thanks as we take this for Jesus Christ, who by his life and death and resurrection opened up to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we join our voices with all of the saints and angels and with the whole of creation to proclaim your name. And we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. And we say the words of the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord has prepared this, his table, for all who know him and all who trust in him alone for their salvation. All who are truly sorry for their sins and believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and who desire to live in, in obedience to him, you're now invited. Yes, we're all beggars and we come to this table of grace and we come receiving these, the gifts of God for the people of God. Come then, for the feast is ready. Christ is raised to life, death is swallowed up, victory is won. Hallelujah, let us keep the feast. And at this point, I'll invite first the elders to kind of make their way forward first. And once they kind of get up here, the rest of us will do our best. We're going to form a circle like we often do on World Communion Sunday. The very back row that goes along the booths will be our, our back part of the circle as we receive. And we'll eat the elements together, wait for my cue.
family of God, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. We respond. <clears throat> Covenant God, we bless you and thank you for the gift of this meal that Jesus came to redeem. We long for the feast with Jesus and the fullness of his coming kingdom. May our worship today deepen our anticipation of that glory. We give thanks, change. We join the song, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He has made us a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and we will reign on earth God will be all and all, righteousness and peace will flourish, everything will be made new, and every eye will see at last that our world belongs to God. Hallelujah, come Lord Jesus. People of God, we have been fed, and as we've just said those words, we hunger and thirst for far more. So go satisfied and yet longing, and go with God's blessing that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Amen. And we'll stay in our circle. I think it's kind of fitting as we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. May we be witnesses as well.